I want to start today, before we start chapter two, just a quick look at the, what to expect for lab. I had some good questions about this. So lab printouts. First, real quick, looking at, you'll see lab printouts, pre-lab grades, lab and post-lab grades, and participation grades. All that stuff is just set up in such a way so I can show you your grade. You do not actually have to submit anything through that. There was some confusion in another course. There's nothing in there for you to submit. That's just there so I can put a grade in and keep it separate. I could put in a one lab grade for the whole thing, but I couldn't be able to keep it separate. And then you will not know, what did I make on the pre-lab? Now this one, this first one is 15 pages. It's really long. I don't expect you to. I mean, they're not all this long. So this part, the first two pages are pre-lab. Then we get into what's called the uh, discussion where you're essentially just trying to, ex it's trying to explain what's all about the lab. And if you read the discussion carefully and the instructions carefully, it'll explain the answers to most of the pre-lab questions. Using this discussion, they'll work through practice problems like how you'll work through in lab. There's a lot of stuff that maybe you don't necessarily need, but but some of this is good background. So then let's go down to like how to use a pipette. The some of these the procedure, that's where we really need to start going. If we don't if we have the pre-lab, that's fine. We don't necessarily need to print off the discussion, but we need to start printing off at the procedure, which is, was that, page eight? Okay. So that tells you how you'll be using this. So the procedure, and it'll say record here, record there. So the procedure is still a bit, we may not do all this procedure because some of it's just really annoying and not really that useful, but, Okay, so then we have, this is the actual lab report. There's not going to be a whole lot of written lab stuff. You'll be filling in these blanks. So it's like measuring something, something with a ruler. Recording in inches, centimeters, and millimeters. And some of these you can do by conversion. Then it says, show the calculation here. I helpfully underlined and put an arrow. This isn't just a blank space to for the sake of blank space, is it's like, show work here. Show the calculation of area, and then show work there. And then part B, of like, oh, there's the two things of part B. Oh, thermometer, there's a, filling in this, filling in this. Show work here, show work here. I tried to underline and put arrows in to hint, hint, your work should go. But so all that's going to be done in lab. The calculations could hypothetically be done outside of lab, but you should have enough time to do them in lab. And then these questions are part of the post lab. So the last page is just questions. These are just practice math. These don't necessarily have a ton to do with lab. Most often the post lab actually includes questions that you have to actually think about what you did in lab in order to really answer them. But these are just like more practice math. Can you do these sig figs? Can you do these conversions? Because this first lab is all about learning some basic techniques, learning about significant digits, learning about conversions, learning about accuracy and precision. It's not exactly a heavy chemistry one. If you say, come in shorts or sandals. I'm not going to kick you out this lab because it's the most dangerous thing we'll use is ethylene glycol or isopropyl alcohol. And that's for like a hot minute at the very end. The rest of the time, it's like water or a ruler. Nothing too dangerous. But okay, I just wanted to quickly go through that. Chapter 2. Chapter two, we're looking at atoms and how we know what we know. So, 
So the first thing we need to get up is the basics of chemical symbols. That each element is going to be represented by either one to two letters of, a, of the alphabet known as our chemical symbol. Now, some of these are going to be pretty straightforward, like H for hydrogen, HE for helium, uh, Uh, like, but like some of these guys are going to be a little bit less obvious because they come from the ancient background. Like the Greeks knew about these guys back in the times of like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. So names like gold, it, it's called AU because it was originally referred to as orum. Lead was originally plumbum. Um, one of my favorites, tungsten, was known as wolfram. So we have these weird symbols for some of them because of the ancient names. So, and we kept that. So some of these you will have to kind of recognize and memorize to some extent, but you'll almost always have a periodic table in front of you, so... Yeah, but we have the yeah, multiple. When we mix these guys together, we'll make a compound. So if I put, say, Fe, which would be ferrum or iron, O, that'd be saying I have a compound of iron oxide, of iron and oxygen. And we're going to use various subscripts to represent the amount of each guy, such that, like, if I say quickly, F E two O three, which is rust, the, the chemical compound for um, in the way a rust that tells me for every two irons in this compound, there are three oxygens bound chemically bound to it. Now, oh, for God's sake, there we go. Okay. okay, so part of this is gonna, we're gonna have some fundamental laws. Remember a law is an observation without an explanation. And what we're not gonna see in these next couple slides is the incredible amount of work that came in, that went into finding out these laws. These laws, may seem relatively straightforward and logical now, but back then, these were not known. There was a lot of misunderstanding. We had people like alchemists way back in the time, mixing chemicals together, making new compounds, trying to find a way to transmute lead into gold, trying to find some numerical compound, not realizing they, they can't turn one element into another, they can just make new structures, new combinations of the two. But so we have the three fundamental laws, the law of conservation of mass, the law of constant composition, law of multiple proportions. Law of conservation of mass simply states that matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. It is only transferred. I mean, some of this is kind of hard to see, especially back in the day with inaccurate equipment. You burn wood, it gets lighter. You have ash. You, you think, oh, we've lost something. Originally, they thought wood contained something called phlogiston. Well, more burnable things, phlogiston. And like, but then they kind of found, well, if I burn some things, they get heavier, and some things, they get lighter. Well, it turns out if you burn wood in a closed container and capture all the gases produced, that container weighs the same at beginning as at end. And that, that's going to be true because matter is neither created nor destroyed. It's just converted from solid to gas. Law of constant composition means that there is going to be a consistent proportion of each element 
within a compound, and that's not going to change. And we can measure that as a percent by mass. Percent by mass, you see mass, the percent mass is mass element over mass compound. In water, there is one 11% H by mass and, and what the rest of it is oxygen. In hydrogen peroxide, it's 5.88% mass. Now, before you get all confused on percent mass, quick, quick think, how would you find out percent of a students with a certain grade? Well, percent of students with a certain grade, say I had three out of 30 students get an A. So I'd put how many students got the letter grade over total number of students, and then I times by 100. So how are we doing percent by mass? Percent by mass is the mass of element, the mass of what we're measuring, the mass of what we care about, just to say the number of students with the grade we care about, over total mass of the total number of students, for example, the previous example, times 100. So mass of what we care about divided by total mass, let's see if, Windows kind of going to have to, yeah, lower the shade, or darken that, yeah, some bad glare. So mass of what we care about over total mass times 100. So the basics here is just, so in the case of water, there's two hydrogens at one ma gram per mole each over oxygen total mass of 18. 2 over 18 is the same as 1, 9. 1 over 9, which if you, 1 over 9 is 0.1 repeating. Times 100 brings that to 11%. Now, then the finally, the law of multiple proportions state that elements will combine together in whole number ratios. So we're always going to form two hydrogens for every one oxygen. We're not going to have a half of oxygen. Not, we're not going to have an H and one half of an oxygen. So, so this seems pretty logical right now, but as I said, before we thought about atoms or knew about atoms, it's all kind of a black box. If I take this ore that weighs this much, I do some various reactions to it, things change. Properties change. Masses change. And we didn't necessarily know what had gone on. So here's where we get to, we're going to talk about a series of scientists and what they did and how they, their work led to the discovery of what we know about the atom. So John Dalton was the first to develop this this underpinning theory that allowed us to get to where we are now. There was a lot of stuff going on before then. A lot of people came before him, but he's the one who had this theory that agree that was the basis for this three fundamental laws. This theory had four key components. Matter is made up of very tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. Now, actually, a Greek philosopher first proposed atoms a while ago, but didn't really have any science to back them up. But so he brought this atom idea of atoms back to the forefront. That atoms of a particular element will each have the same mass, but the mass of an atom of a different element is going to have a different mass. So the, each hydrogen atom is going to be one gram per mole. Each oxygen atom is going to be 16 grams per mole. I can pretty reliably trust each oxygen atom is going to weigh the same, but oxygen and hydrogen weigh completely different masses. Atoms will combine together in what we form molecules, and when they do, they combine in small whole number ratios. And then atoms of some pair of elements can combine with each other in 
different small whole number ratios to form different compounds. As I said before, water and hydrogen peroxide, H2O, we drink, we live. H2O2, disinfectant, oxidizer. You drink that, you're going to die. CO2, that's our byproduct. We exhale that every day. Plants breathe that. It's all well and good. It's pretty benign. We will not, we can breathe tons of this and not die. CO, small amount of that will bind with your blood and kill you. It binds in the same position that oxygen does. And then we're left with gasping for air. So, now keep in mind all of this is still hypothetical. He has not shown atoms actually exist but his theory states that if atoms exist, this would explain all the stuff we're seeing while we play around with these ores and these compounds and these various elements at the time. So, and even then, he's not fully right. Atoms are not indivisible. We can break up atoms into protons, electrons, and neutrons. But for now, this is our a good starting point. As it is, protons, electrons, and neutrons can further be split up into things like quarks and stuff, but that's heavy-duty physics that we won't worry about at all. But with this new backbone, this new theory that people can work off of, this stimulated a bunch of research in the field. And allowed us to find actually even more things, the subatomic particles that make up the atoms, some with positive charges, some with negative charges. And before we go any further, I just want to quickly remind us that positive repels positive, negative repels negative, and positive and negative attract. That's going to give us the context we need in the next couple slides. So we have... First, we have people inventing cathode ray tubes. You may have heard of these before. You may not have. A really old technology we eventually used to apply it into TVs. But a cathode ray tube was simply a glass tube where we hook two wires to either end. We pull a heavy vacuum on this to empty out the tube of most of the gas particles, and then we connect it to a power source. So the key thing, you, hopefully you remember, if a current is not, if a circuit is not complete, electricity will not flow. You have two split wires, electricity will, will not flow, it stops. The second you complete the circuit, either you touch both wires or whatever, circuit electrons flow. Now note, if you, do not pull a vacuum on this tube. Electricity will not flow. So what they notice is when they pull the vacuum and connected it to a power source, electricity will flow and the tube begins to fluoresce or glow. This is because the tiny invisible electrons are able to go from one wire, shoot through space, and reach the other wire. These were called cathode rays at the time because they were expelled from the cathode, thus attracted to the anode. So the anode in this case was the positive plate or the positive wire. So the electrons were attracted to the positive wire. So now if there is no vacuum, the electrons hit gas particles, they disperse, they can't reach the other end. But with this vacuum on, the gas particles are sufficiently socially distanced that the electrons can squeeze through from one end to the other. 
Now, the electrons aren't necessarily just going as a straight line as I've drawn in this crummy little drawing over here. They're going to go all over the place. Where they hit the walls, the walls glow. They get absorbed in the wall of the glass, and the glass begins to glow where the electrons have hit. So the electrons are being sprayed all over the place, hitting the walls, but enough of it make it through to power the system. Now, people do a whole bunch of fun little experiments. They put stuff in there, and it blocks the thing, and they can make a dark spot where it doesn't glow. Or they try, they learn, oh, if I put a magnet up to this, I can make only one half of it glow because I shoot the electrons to the other half. And they learn, oh, I apply an electrical field. I can do the same thing. So they learn, oh, okay, these... Whatever these cathode rays are, they react to electrical, external electrical fields and magnetism. So a scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson was able to do an experiment where he applies two opposing fields, a constant magnetic field and a constant, well, and a variable electrical field that essentially cancel each other out by canceling the magnetic by relating the magnetic to electrical field he was able to determine the charge to mass ratio of these cathode rays basically it's like he created a, something pushing it left and then he pushed it back right and by seeing what electrical field needed to push it back what momentum the guy the electrons had and what charge you needed to push it back. So he finds, here's a fundamental property of these cathode rays. That's the main thing. He found a fundamental property, the charge to mass ratio. By itself, not too useful though. Which is where we get to Millikan. So Robert Millikan uses the oil drops to measure the charge of electron. The basic idea here is that he had a nebulizer, some like, like perfume bottle that sprayed tiny particles of oil into a empty drum. Like he evacuated all the gas from there, sprayed these oil droplets into there. Now, as they float in the vacuum, they'll slowly sink to the bottom. Now the bottom of that drum contains a two electrical plates, one with a pinhole through it. So as they fall through this pinhole, you can try to control the flow of the, of the droplet. So it's just dripping one drop at a time through there. As they fall through, they're hit with x-rays and thus charge. And then he can turn on the electrical plates. So we now have charged oil droplets of known masses flowing down. The gravity pulls these droplets downwards but the electrical plates turned on repel them back upwards. And so by controlling his electrical field, he can slow the droplets, stop the droplets, have them hover, and even push them back up towards the top. Now by knowing the mass of the droplets and gravity, he could now calculate what is the charge of an electron. The charge is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Don't mo bother memorizing that. It's a fundamental number. You won't need to memorize it. You'll be given it if you even need it, which you won't. From this, because we knew the charge to mass ratio from J.J. Thompson, and now that we have the charge, we could figure out what is the mass, which is 9.1 times 10 to the negative 28th grams. Really, really, really small. Now, because they knew atoms were neutral, compounds were neutral, they proposed they needed to have a equally positive charge ion, known as a proton. And because they knew the approximate mass of many of these, at of these atoms, and they knew that this electron was much too small to account for that mass. The other mass, the proton, had to be much, much heavier. 
So this is a bad model. The only reason we use this model is just to show that sometimes science can be wrong. Sometimes hypotheses can be wrong. That at this point, atoms are still a mystery. We didn't know what they look like. There, there are several different models. This was one of them. The reason why this had any traction at all was because J.J. Thompson was the one who proposed it, the guy who first kind of found the cathode rays and found the charge to mass ratio. There were some ones that looked like a planetary model of the atom, which is a lot closer to what we have now. But so J.J. Thompson reasoned that atoms are neutral, so they must be made of almost equal amounts of positive and negative. Now, because the electrons are so very small, the, the, they're just, the, the large amount of the mass must be positive. They say, well, the, the bulk of this atom is all this big positive red, like spread out like a pie, like a pudding. And because these electrons are so small, they're just going to be dotted throughout this atom, like tiny little raisins in this plum pudding. They're saying that, so the mass, we got this big old positive interspersed with tiny little negatives, but the amount of negatives and positives cancel each other out. This was called the plum pudding model. Now, the beauty of this is we are going to test this plum pudding model. This is what we would expect to see if this works. So this present, uh, this chemist named by the name of Rutherford and his associate Hans Geiger of, you know, the Geiger counter fame tested this plum pudding model hypothesis by analyzing the scattering pattern of alpha particles. An alpha particle is a two proton, two neutron uh, particle that looks like a positive helium nucleus, what we'll know. But it's a, a magical particle that's pretty heavy and pretty positive. It's doubly positive. And they're going to shoot this into a thin sheet of gold foil. Gold, it's pretty massive, but you can make a really thin sheet. You want a thin sheet so it has a likelihood of this penetrating through without hitting too many atoms. Now, the idea here is so we're going to have a radon gun that's going to shoot alpha particles. It's going to puncture through this atom, and it's going to hit a fluorescent plate, a fluorescent screen behind it. Wherever this radiation hits, the radiation darkens the plate. Whenever you see an X-ray, you notice your bone is white and everything else is black. That's because your bone absorbs the particles, the X-rays. The fluorescent plate absorbs the X-rays and turns black where your bone is not. So the same idea. They're going to shoot this radon gun through this. And because of the dispersedness of the atom in the plum pudding model, they expect this positive charge to just punch right through. Just like if you shot bullets at a pudding, it's going to blow right through its back and go through. It might have a slight amount of deflection as it goes through, but for the most part, it will not stop it. Even though positive will be hitting positive, it's so dispersed, there's not going to have a big problem. So what actually happened? So thank God the fluorescent plates were arranged in a semicircular pattern all around the, uh, the gold foil. Because when he looked at this, he found, yes, some particles did puncture through. Some did experience minor deflection, but then some had intense backward scattering where they were repulsed when you shot through. Now, this was because 
the we have we don't actually have a plum pudding of an atom. We have what's called the nuclear model, where most of the atom is empty space. If you shoot this positive charge through, it's going to pass through the, the space between the atoms, and it's going to go right through harmlessly. But we have a nucleus, which is a dense, positively charged center of the atom, a candy nougat. When it hits that, positive and positive repel, flinging the alpha particles backwards. So it's like you're hitting a brick wall or like some sort of metal and it's the bullet is reflecting. It's ricocheting off in odd ways. So we have some backscattering. And so we, we realized, oh, that model doesn't quite fit. We had to develop a new model to explain this. And that's where we get our basic nuclear model. So we know there's protons in the center. There's electrons somewhere in the cloud, but it's mostly empty space. So as I said, the positive charge and the majority of the mass are in the small area, which is the nucleus. The plural of nucleus is nuclei. The vast majority of the atom is empty space. We have small negatively charged electrons spread throughout. And a number of negatively charged electrons is equal to the number of positively charged protons. That's the basic model. It's not complete, not perfect, but it's what we had at the time. Now, however, this model didn't fully explain everything because if we figure out the number of protons, well, the masses don't add up. Hydrogen, if it, well, we have one proton and so it's about one mass unit. But helium with two protons has four mass units. Lithium with three protons has six mass units. So we're missing some magical mass in here that's neither positive nor negative. And so we later discover neutrons, which are neutral molecules with mass similar to the proton. It would be found much later, later by Ruth, uh, Ruthford's student. They did an experiment that essentially shot out, when he collided particles together, we shot out a, a particle that could not be deflected by by magnetic fields. It was neither positive nor negative. And so they figured, oh, this must be that missing mass, the neutrons. But for the sake of convenience, we're going to label these guys and make it a little bit easier. So when we look at particles, a proton, often abbreviated P, technically the charge is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. But we're going to just call a proton having essentially plus one. Uh, the mass, we're going to call the mass unit or AMU of a proton is 1.0073. Don't worry about these numbers. If you actually need them, they will be provided. But a proton is found within the nucleus. A neutron, zero charge. A mass of 1.0087 AMU. You'll notice it's similar but not quite exactly the same to the proton. The electron, negative one charge, but the comparative mass is incredibly small, 0 0.000549. So electrons add almost no mass to the overall structure, even if you have a lot of them. So each element will have a different number of protons, which is called the atomic number. When we use the atomic number in a equation, it's often abbreviated by Z. But the key thing is each element is defined by its atomic number. If it has a different atomic number, it's a different element. Each carbon will always have six protons. That is what makes it make it carbon. Each nitrogen will have seven. Each oxygen will have eight. That is what makes them unique. That's what powers them. You have 
more or less, they convert between the two. A neutral compound will always have equal number of protons and electrons. But here's a, one of the tricky things that wasn't quite figured out at first. Not all atoms have the same number of neutrons. If we have a different number of protons, it's a different atom. But a different number of neutrons, it can still have very similar properties, almost identical. The only different properties have to do with having a slightly heavier mass. These different neutron elements are called isotopes. Isotopes. Like an isosceles triangle. An isosceles triangle have two equal sides, protons and electrons, one side different. In this case, the neutrons. So hydrogen could have one proton, zero neutrons. It could have one proton, one neutron, and be called deuterium. It could have one proton, two neutrons, called tritium. These are the three major isotopes of hydrogen. In nuclear stuff, helium is usually two protons, two neutrons, but it could have two protons, one neutron, and that gets formed when stars combust hydrogen. Many of them we may have seen before. Chlorine has two really big isotopes. Carbon, most carbon is car called carbon-12, but carbon-13 is a relatively common isotope. Carbon-14 is uh, what we use for carbon dating. That's another really important isotope that happens. But so the isotopes will distinguish these guys by looking at the mass number, often abbreviated as A. The mass number is equal to the number of protons and neutrons. We don't care about the electrons. The electrons don't add to the mass. So we can represent any given isotope by the, the symbol A, Z over X. So if I, X is just the chemical element. So for the example of carbon 13, carbon 13 would be C 13, six. C, 13, 6. The 13 tells me it has 6 and 7 neutrons. And the carbon is already given. So, now not all ions, uh, not all atoms are neutral. Some atoms are charged particles called ions. Now, ion is generated due to the loss or gain of an electron within the electron cloud. Please note, protons and neutrons will not change. If they have changed, something drastically important has happened within that atom. Often, you're undergoing a nuclear reaction if those change. So it's really easy to lose or gain electrons. It's really hard to lose or gain neutrons or protons. Because you have the dense core, you have this cloud of electrons. Electrons can wander away. So when electrons are lost, we're losing a negative. Whenever you subtract a negative, it's the same as adding a positive. So the... the the atom becomes positively charged. It becomes a cation. Whenever electrons are gained, the ion will become negatively charged. This is called an anion. So the last thing we can add right here to the symbol is a plus or minus charge, where that charge is equal to the loss of electrons. How many electrons has it lost? So if we have more electrons than protons, it's negative. Less electrons than protons, it's positive. And I'm going to finish up after this slide. We're going to essentially just do some practice. Do some practice here. This practice is just recognizing 
the number of protons and the number of neutrons and number of electrons within a compound. So lithium three, seven, proton, neutron, electron. Given, you wouldn't have to be given the three if you saw the elemental symbol because you can look on the periodic table and find how many protons because lithium always has three. Always has three. But so the neutron count, the neutron count is determined by subtracting the atomic number from the mass number. So seven minus three is, mm -hmm. now because there is no charge, it is, well, sorry, equal number of protons and electrons. So three. Chlorine, 1735. So 17, 17. Now, feel free to use your calculator if you have to. But yeah, what? 18. So, let's see, phosphorus. What's it? Did I say 1531? Yeah, 1531. Yeah, yeah 15, 16, 15. I'm going to skip the, la uh, the carbon and move on to potassium plus one. So potassium positive 1939. Okay. 19, that's straightforward. 39 minus 19, that's 20. Now positive. Now normally they're equal amounts, but since this is positive, we must have one less electron. So 18, 18, because protons minus electrons gives you the charge. And I'll finish up with, well, let's go with oxygen. Oxygen, two minus 16, eight. So eight, eight. Since this is two minus, there must be two more electrons. So eight minus 10 gives us negative two. Eight minus 10 gives us negative two. And the last one, iron 26, 56. So there's 30 neutrons because it's positive three. The number of electrons must be 23. So 23 minus 26 is positive three. Now, if you miss any of these, or as I skip through them, I put, you notice I put the neutrons in a different order from the electrons. You can always come back to them. They're always on the slides. Okay, that is where we're gonna end for today.